let's give it another minute and then we'll get started. Okay, okay. let's just give it one more minute because we see ah. some people that are joining as we're talking, okay? That's fine, sure. Perfect. And it's a sunny day today, too, so that's good. Oh, it's all stormy here. Is it really? Where are you? Uh, St. Pete, Florida. Oh, you're in St. Pete. Oh, well, the storms usually start out west and then they move east. Yep. We'll get it tomorrow or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we're winter is ending. I think we're going to be approaching summer very quickly. Yes, very quickly. <laughs> Sad, but what are you going to do? Winter lasts like two weeks in Florida. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I know. <laughs> All right. I think we're ready. Um, welcome okay. everyone to the first of four caregiver webinars in 2022, presented by Mitsubishi Canon Pharma. For those who don't know me, my name is Camila Arinzaga, and I'm the regional program manager for the ALS Association Florida chapter in Miami-Dade County. And I'm happy to introduce you to Dr. Barbara Simmons. She's gonna be giving a presentation today about frontal temporal dementia and cognitive changes. She has been a health psychologist for 30 years, addressing the needs of high functioning individuals whose lives have been affected by altering illnesses or circumstances. She helps people cope more effectively and adapt to their needs to maintain their quality of life. And she's our amazing psychologist at the University of Miami ALS Clinic. Barbara, please go ahead. Thank you, Camilla. But did you get my my um, thing that I wanted you to post? I scanned it to oh. you. Yes, Marixa, were we able to do that? I know we were trying to figure out oh. technology and upload it. I don't know if we were able to do so, but if oh. not, we'll, we, well, we can find not a way to distribute it. Uh, I, I just asked um, Stephanie to see if she had um, already uh, created a link. I will get back to you shortly. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about uh, cognitive changes, frontotemporal dementia, FTD, in ALS patients, and how it affects caregivers, because you people are living with it every day. So um, I wanted... Uh, the first thing I wanted to do was to sh go over a little inventory with you. And if it's not uploaded, if you have pencil and paper, uh, that would be great. It won't take long. There's 10 questions. It's a self-assessment inventory uh, that caregivers can fill out themselves. And it gives you a good idea of the level of stress that you are experiencing. And so the items are strongly agree, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree. And I, I won't necessarily, I won't read them all because I don't want to take the time, but if it's, if it's uploaded, then you can see the whole thing. Uh, the first one is my life satisfaction has suffered because of the care that I provide. So it's strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree. I often feel physically exhausted. And um, these are all reality-based statements because we know that you're not sleeping all through the night, et cetera. <coughs> Excuse me. From time to time, I wish I could run away from the situation I am in. My oh. health, I'm sorry. Oh. My health has suffered. My health is affected by the care situation. Uh, I'm worried about my future because of the care I give. My relationships with other family members, relatives, friends, and acquaintances are suffering as a result of the care. Uh, you probably all are affected to some extent by all of these statements. Uh, the, the more you acknowledge, you know, like if strongly agree as opposed to disagree or just agree, the more of these that you acknowledge, the more stress that you are experiencing. And stress can lead to depression. Uh, 40, over 40% 40 of caregivers report feeling depressed. Uh, can lead to health issues. 
uh, personality changes, and it also can lead to the possibility of abuse while you are taking care of your loved one. Because when people are overstressed, they're not in control necessarily of all their emotions. So I want to, having said that, I want to go through some of the changes that are um, prominent in frontotemporal dementia. One of the things that happens is, and it happens gradually, so you may not notice it over time, uh, apathy. People are indifferent. They don't really care. You know, if, um, if you, somebody suggests something, we're going to do something, they don't really care. They, they have a hard time initiating. It could be conversation. It could be finding words. Uh, it could be uh, affect, mood. Sometimes what you will see in FTD is this uncontrollable laughing or crying for no reason. There is medicine for that, but that's a result of the FTD and the, the dementia. So there is medicine for that, and, and that can be managed more successfully than some of the other ones. Uh, people are not goal directed. They don't have plans. They, they sit around all day long and watch television. They don't do anything. They don't start to do anything. Uh, and if you encourage them, it's, it's laborious and tedious. Um, one of the things that you'll find is that sometimes people appear normal and appear reasonable, but they are not reliable when it comes to responding. For example, they may not give accurate uh, descriptions or uh, about their breathing, their choking or swallowing kind of situation. They will tend to minimize or trivialize those issues because not because they want to, it's just, it's an organic thing and uh, they have very little control over that. Now, the area that we're talking about, frontotemporal is here over your eyes and goes back behind your ears. And that's the area that's the last uh, to develop in the brain. So just as an example, uh, if you have young children or teenagers or young children and they do something really crazy and you could say to them, what were you thinking? Or what did you think was going to happen if you threw the rock through the window or whatever? The, the truth of the matter is they were not thinking. They don't think about um, consequences because that part of the brain in young people doesn't develop really until mid twenties. And that's the part of the brain in frontotemporal dementia that deteriorates in, in adults in our ALS patients. So they cannot process or think ahead or think about consequences. So you may have a conversation with them and you, or the doctor and thinking that they are perfectly normal and reasonable, but they're not reality based at that point. And that's where as caregivers, you have to step in and, they know, you know, that's not really what's going on here. Uh, this is the situation, you know. So um, there are many, there are many behaviors that are that are consistent with the FTD. Um, lack of insight is one, of course. Um, they could become hoarders or become compulsive or impulsive. People fall more when they have the FTD because they're not really processing what's in their environment and how safe they are. Uh, they're not as verbal as they had been before. Uh, it takes longer to think of words. We have, we, we do a test, I do a test. It's the ALS cognitive behavioral screen. And in it, I ask people to tell me all the, tell me all the words you can think of in one minute, beginning with the letter F, F is in Frank. People who have FTD in a minute can come up with maybe four words, five words, whereas a normal person will come up with anywhere from 12 to 20. Uh, so that, that's one way you, you will see in your, as, as a caregiver, you'll see changes. Um, when, when you ask them to say the alphabet, they will drop letters. I mean, and in Spanish or in English, they will leave out letters, even though they've known the alphabet since they were five years old something like that, okay? So um, as, as caregivers, um, as caregivers, you, if you have assistance, if you don't have to be there 24 seven, you're ahead of the game. 
if you are there 24 seven and you don't really have respite and you don't have other family members or friends who can give you a break, you're under more stress. Um, and it's also uh, interesting because again, caregivers get overtired and when they're overtired, it, you know, everybody suffers, especially you as a caregiver. Um, what I want to tell you, there are positive ways of looking, some people find it automatically, positive ways of feeling as a caregiver that you are benefiting in a way from being a caregiver. And that could be, um, I'm, I'm giving back to somebody who's been helping me all through these years. Um, okay. Okay, well, I won't be just uh, But there's a positive aspect to caregiving. Think about the success in various in being a caregiver. You know, none of us is prepared for sickness and problems and caregiving as we have. We have, in school, they tell you, you know, say you have taking a history class. They tell you, you're gonna have a test on Friday. These are the chapters you have to read. And this is what we're gonna ask of you. You know that when you go to get a driver's license, you read the book, you take a test, where you pass or fail, you can take it again, but you have to go through the, the process. There is no preparation for illness. There is no preparation for coping, being a caregiver. We learn that as we go. And you are really heroes to be doing what you are doing because, and it changes all the time. You know, today may be under control, but tomorrow there may, may be a new issue, a new personality change, a new cognitive limitation. And then you have to go and cope with that. Now, I think, I think you get some, there was, I saw the booklet from Alsa that Camila has. And those are helpful suggestions in there, but understand also that what you are going through is extraordinary. And um, sometimes, you know, if you find if you can't find comfort through a, or through a religion, if you have a clergyman that you want to talk to, certainly don't do this alone. I, I like to tell people when they come to a second clinic that you are not alone. You have the whole team now and the resources of the team and the University of Miami to help you get through these trying times. Um, take advantage, really take advantage. One of the things I, I, I think I told you, you, I think most of you know me from being in the clinic, unless you're on the West Coast, but um, don't do this alone, make contact. You, there, there are ways for you to meet other caregivers, whether it's strictly online or phone calls or face-to-face. Face-to-face -face has been very difficult the last couple of years, but it's getting better. But talk to people. It's like when you call somebody who is a caregiver, they know exactly what you're going through. You don't have to explain anything. You don't have to apologize for anything. You just say, you know, today's just one of those days. And they will know exactly what you're talking about. Okay, don't be afraid to try, you know, if, you, if you're not sleeping well at night, don't be afraid to take time for yourself during the day so you can catch up. If your care receiver is comfortable, safe, clean, resting, watching TV, whatever, you know he or she is safe, say, I'm gonna be in the other room, I'm gonna take 15, 20 minutes just to close my eyes take a bath, whatever, and I'll come back to you after that. Uh, sometimes, and, and do that, take time for yourself because that's really important. I have a friend who gets up in the morning and she takes her coffee, she's on, in her townhouse, she takes her coffee outside and drinks it and watches the ants as they run around or watches, you know, listens for the birds or looks at the flowers or just appreciates having fresh air. You have accomplished more than most people have ever. And so you need to give yourselves credit and find ways that you can help yourself to de-stress uh, because you know, stress makes everything worse. You know that if you have a headache, stress makes it worse. 
So we want to be able to help you is in as many ways as we possibly can. And I think there are comments or something. Let me see. Oh, no, that has nothing to do with me. Okay, so um, if you have questions, comments, I can be more specific if you give me specific questions or, or focus. Um, oops. No, okay. Well, then let me go back to what I was saying. Try to, I, I spend a lot of time problem solving. Um, you know, when I see people in the clinic or otherwise, they, you know, there's an issue and then we try. If you can't do something in the way you have always done it, and this is certainly true for your care receiver, if you cannot do something in the way you've always done it, or you can't go to activities that you have always enjoyed, what options do you have? The more choices you have in your life, the better your quality of life and the easier the day will be, okay? So talk to people, talk to people. Now, I, I don't know how your, your patients are. Some patients get very greedy for your time. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but they feel lonely or, or frightened or whatever. And so they wanna know you're there all the time. So how do you cope with that? How do you make time for yourself? How do you, how do you do problem solving when you have needs of your own and you don't know at this point you know, what are my alternatives, okay? Make sure you simplify whenever possible, organize whenever possible, plan ahead. Yeah, there's always an emergency, but generally you can plan ahead. Um, I was listening to the another uh, workshop from, I guess it was last year, and, and somebody said um, she was disappointed because somebody she wanted to rely on is not comfortable or cannot be around a sick person. Uh, and, and she was a, a, a offended, upset, certainly, and disappointed. And I, I want to tell you, based on personal history, my father was a doctor. And he was in and out of hospitals all the time. And that was, that was a major part of his life. But his brother became ill. He, we were down here, actually, in Miami Beach. Um, his brother became ill and was in the hospital. And my father could not go to visit him in the hospital. And I said, Dad, he's your brother. And he said, I can't go. It's too upsetting. I cannot do it. I ended up taking him, driving him, and going into the hospital with him to visit his brother. So I understand when people are reluctant or upset, they can't do that. It's not because they don't care for you. It's just something emotionally that they cannot handle. So look for alternatives and that's 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 another you know option that you have have a to-do list if you have laundry to do grocery shopping to do whatever going to the post office whatever ask somebody to do that for you people will say how can i help and you say well i don't know but if you have a list you can you can say here pick one of these and that way you get some of your needs met and you don't feel as rushed as you would otherwise if you felt you had to do everything else, okay? Uh, when, you, when you have uh, interrupted sleep, and that happens a lot, I'm sure, and you get up during the night for whatever reason, because he, he, she has to go to the bathroom in pain, restless, whatever, insomniac, figure out a way that you can do a little catching up for yourself. How are you going to get some more rest. You can't go on three hours sleep a night. You know, you can for a little bit, but you can't do it for long. It's not humanly possible. And the other thing is, according to the research, if you go three consecutive nights sleeping less than five hours a night, you get in your car, it's like you're a drunk driver. Your reflexes are off, your startle response is different. You're just exhausted and you can't do that safely. So figure out ways whether you can, um, if, you can if you have the resources financially to hire people, that's great. If you do not, contact Lorena Otignano, our social, work, uh, social worker, and she can connect you or advise you which agencies to go to so that you can get on a list and get a certain number of hours every week to, um, 
to give you, you know, somebody will come to your home. If it's an hour a day or four hours a day, whatever, take advantage of that because that's your time. You can go outside and, and watch the flowers grow, or you can go to the store, you could take a nap, but that would be your time. So see if you cannot arrange for something like that, okay? If you can get a family member in, uh, that's another way of, of coping with this. Um, children. Hey, Barbara, are, Barbara yes. I hate to interrupt you. I see that Camila has a question for you. Do you no. mind answering? No, I don't mind. Okay, the prevalence of FTD on ALS patients, it used to be thought that it was like 10 to 20%, but it's really 35 to 50% of patients who get FTD. So it's a considerable number. And um, it's a question of how, you know, coping and learning how to cope and learning how to handle somebody who is really dementing, you know? Um, anyway, I want to, I, I will come. I want to come back to that. I will, but I want to talk about children as caregivers. Okay. Um, children very often are enlisted, drafted to become mm. caregivers out of necessity. Uh, generally, they, on average, they contribute like five hours a day. Now, children also have no preparation for being a caregiver, but they do benefit from knowing that they are contributing and they are being helpful. The advantage children have, and this is ages like eight to 18. This is not uh, five-year-olds. Um, but they, they see, they can de-stress much more easily than adults can. So they'll go out skateboarding or bike riding, or they'll play soccer or whatever. And that, and that way they can feel less stress and, and you know, go on with their lives in, a, in, an, in a, an effective way. Okay, so um, FGD on ALS patients, yes, it's 35 to 50%. Uh, and it, it's tough. If you've ever had family members, grandparents, whatever, mothers who have been, de you know, demented as they've gotten older, you may have some experience in, in approaching, you know, somebody with dementia. Excuse me. So... Sometimes, I, I will tell you this, it's better not, not to ask a question like, how are you feeling today? For us, it's a very simple, normal question to ask. But if somebody has dementia, it could be very difficult. Don't ask questions, make statements. You look good today. Uh, it's a beautiful day. Um, here, we're gonna, we're gonna wear this today. Not what would you like to wear if, you know, if that's an issue, but avoid asking questions, just make statements. Um, <clears throat> sometimes you have to make decisions that you know that nobody likes. You don't like the choice. He doesn't like the, she doesn't like the choice. Family members are going to be critical. Oh, you know, what are you going to do? Sometimes there are no good options. And that's, that's a fact. Sometimes there are no good choices to make. And then your job is to decide <clears throat> the lesser of the evils. What's least offensive, what's least troublesome, what's most effective, whatever, you know, those are considerations that you make for yourselves. And maybe everybody has different considerations, but sometimes, and it's hard to do that. Sometimes, you know, you're, you, the relationship has been such that you've shared decision making, or that other person is the one who has been the primary decision maker. It's different now. The ball is in your court, and so you have to be able to respond, even though you don't like it. It's the better, like you know, the better choice, the better option. And sometimes that make you makes you feel like a stinker, but oh well, you know, some things you just have to bite the bullet. The another consideration, which I find very interesting, and I don't know how you all will react to it, and I've seen it in the clinic. People come in, couples come in. And one of them has ALS. And over time, I can see, I'm sure other people can, that these people, they've been married a long time. They don't really like each other, you know? For whatever reason, they've stayed together. Financially, it's easier. Uh, they do it for the children. They don't believe in divorce, whatever. 
but that we see people who really truly don't like each other. And so caregiving becomes a real burden because they resent having to do this for another person or the, the care receiver is tentative and questioning because maybe he or she doesn't trust the other one, you know? So that's a burden and that, that's a really difficult one to handle because um, most, I mean, it's, it's too late now. Some people leave, this is true. Most people don't, most people stay together and do and go through all the care necessary to provide for the, for the patient. But it certainly makes for more stress and more aggravation, more frustrating ideas, you know. Um, one of the things that's effective is changing the way we think. And it may sound silly, it may sound hard, but it's really possible to do that. It's called cognitive reframing. If you, and I've used this example before, if you say, either the patient or you say, oh my God, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. I don't know how I'm going to live through this. I don't know how I can deal with this. Every day is torture or you get the message. But if you can change that a little bit and say, this is really a tough situation, but I have been through tough situations before and I know I will find a way to do this too. And it changes the emphasis on everything because it empowers you to be, um, to be more in charge, to have more self-confidence and to be more capable of doing, and have less resentment, of course, because, uh, you know, life is, life is not fair. You do all the right things in life. You expect, you know, you all, if you're married, you have plans when I retired we're going to travel around the world. When I retire, I'm going to take up this hobby or whatever. And then, and then life happens and this illness comes along and it changes your whole life completely, you know? So there's that disappointment that's, you know, this is not the way I expected to live my life. Uh, the burden of caregiving, the lack of sleep, it's a good idea as a caregiver to make it and make sure you go for a doctor's appointment, a checkup every year. Uh, people who at people who endure ongoing stress for whatever reason, in this case, it's because you're a caregiver. People who go through unending stress levels are more prone to illness and to accidents. They will fall, break a leg, hit their heads, whatever. But it happens regularly. And there was also a higher incidence of mortality because of the stress and because you're not, you know, people are not taking care of themselves, not doing the things that are in their best interest. Um, I use one of the things I've learned along the way is this expression, don't should on yourself. You know, people feel I have to do this. I should be doing this. I shouldn't complain. I should be more whatever, you know? That's not reality. And what you're doing is a form of, from my way of thinking, what you're doing is a form of self-abuse. I should, no, you shouldn't. You do what you can and you keep everything in order as best you can. You try to enlist as many people as you can in caregiving so that you don't have to be there constantly all the time. And take it as it comes, and again, I, I'm delayed in saying this, but as a psychologist, if you're having a lot of trouble with these things, you're not sleeping, you're frustrated, you're angry. Oh, excuse me. Um, see somebody. Most of you have insurance. I said this to everybody. On the back of your insurance card, it'll say either behavioral health or customer service. And if you call that number, tell them you want a health psychologist because um, you don't need somebody for marriage counseling or have family issues. You need somebody to help you get through this major illness. So you wanna have somebody who knows about health issues. And hopefully they will give you at least one name. Uh, and then you can call that, per if you get more than one name, decide who you wanna call it, a man or a woman, 
you like the last name better than another one. It, it's strictly arbitrary. But when you connect, so make an appointment to talk to that person. If you see him, her, two or three times and you don't feel there's a connection because there's a chemistry in everything, you know, not just in heterosexual relationships, but professionally also. If you don't feel there's a connection, go to that other name that you have. You're not obligated to stay with one person if you don't find it's, it's therapeutic, okay? So be, try to be as much uh, a caregiver for yourself as you are for your patient, okay? Um, and another issue actually uh, is, does your patient appreciate what you're doing? in any way, whether it's verbally or, or physically in some way, acknowledge that what you're doing is heroic or really wonderful and your patient appreciates what you're doing. I don't think people say, I don't know how often people say that, but it's also okay to ask for a compliment. For example, you could, you could whatever, changing the bed, giving a bath, feeding, whatever, if you say, I think I did that pretty well, what do you think? You're asking for acknowledgement, you're asking for a compliment, or oh, just recognition, it doesn't even have to be a compliment. But that way, you know, that your patient knows that you have done something, and you can feel good about that. You know, sometimes being a caregiver gives people meaning in their lives which is an advantage, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a positive outcome of being a caregiver. Um, sometimes it makes you appreciate what you have, certainly. Um, but it's a challenge. I think every day is a challenge and it's a matter of figuring out the easiest, best way for you and your loved one to function every day. So I don't know, do you wanna ask questions or comments? I could, you know. I don't want to monopolize this whole thing if you guys have questions about something. Hi, Barbara. I have a hi, quick question. Hi, Camila. Hi. So you mentioned a little bit about um, when you have like a child as a caregiver, right? And like the changes of roles. When it comes to FTD and like the care that a caregiver is providing, how is it, how is it like harder for like an elderly caregiver versus like a child or like an adult child? to understand the changes, the cognitive changes that are going in, you know, the patient's going through and how to better manage them according to the age? Good question. Okay. Well, I think, I think uh, it, it does vary by age. I think children can feel good about contributing, doing something for a parent or a relative anyway. Uh, and as I said, they can, you know, they could de-stress much easy, much more easily because they can go out and, and play. Um, I, I, most children that, that, that I'm aware of have um, asked some relative, you know, relatively appropriate questions. And it's up to parents to provide age appropriate answers. I know some of our patients say their children, they're young, six, seven, eight year olds say, um, why are you talking like, why are you talking funny or why aren't you walking the way you used to? And, and parents will tend to say, oh, they don't give a diagnosis. They say, I have a, a neuromuscular problem and I'm working on it. And, and that satisfies the children as far as caregiving is concerned, like, because children usually want to do things for their parents. They, they enjoy it. Is, and they also, they don't know what they're doing. They have no preparation for this, just as adults have no preparation for illness. These kids don't know either. And they, they go kind of by the seat of their pants, but they know they're helping and they feel good about that. The majority of young people who are helping family members are, are feeling good and successful about it. Um, as far as adult children are concerned, uh, it's, it's, it's a challenge also because they were generally working full time. Some of the some of the adult children have stopped working to become full time caregivers. And, and that's an issue because then they go through the same thing that 
spouses do, you know, they're up at night, uh, they're, they're not working, they're home all the time, they're not socializing as much as they would have, uh, you know, if they had, you know, been in a different situation. Um, and again, the situation, <laughs> the relationship that parents have with children, or that children have with parents, is really a reflection on how they, the relationship they had with their parents, period, growing up, were they good parents? It's a subjective thing, of course, but people who learn as children that their parents are caregivers or they care about other people, they show empathy and they show concern. They're good to, like as a child, they're good to their grandparents or so on. Learn that it's the right thing to do or that it is expected that we give back, that we help our grandparents or we help our parents when they get older. If you didn't have a good relationship with your children as they were growing up, don't expect them to be there so easily when you're ill or when you need extra help. So if, if uh, this may be a generalization, but if you're, you know, if you're not getting a lot of input or assistance from your children, um, there's more to it than just indifference usually. Uh, as, a, as older people, as spouses, um, there's a fear, I think, of being alone again. You know, if you've been with somebody for 30, 40, 50 years, and now that person is on the decline, not only are you more tired physically, but emotionally, and there's more concern, you know, what's going to happen to my finances? There's more to think about. And, and um, what, you, by the way, what you can do in a situation like, don't do it when somebody's already very ill because it's too late. But it may be a good idea um, to separate your income, your resources, go to an elder lawyer, separate, divide it in half. So if you have $10,000, each of you actually has $5,000. Then if the expenses mount as with caregiving and you know it costs more to take care of somebody, you only spend down or he spends down, or she, I'm sorry, the patient spends down $5,000 and you still have your $5,000. You don't have to bankrupt yourself as a caregiver. You can protect yourself. Then when the patient has exhausted resources, then it's much, then you can get Medicaid and, and county and state resources that will be, that would not be available if there was more money. I'm not sure that's a hundred percent correct, but basically it is. And Lorena, again, our social worker can give you more information on that. So there's a, there's a fear of, you know, it's, it's very costly. What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my money? What am I going to do when I'm alone? How am I going to cope? Um, and it, it, it's, it's very distressing. And again, that's where you can, you know, either talk to a lawyer, talk to a psychologist, talk to a social worker, people who are very experienced in knowing how to handle these things. Oh, let me see what's in there. We have a question in the chat box. Yeah, yeah I'm trying to read it. Since over 35% of patients with ALS can experience cognitive changes, are these changes usually a result of the ALS progression? Or can these cognitive changes be separate in parallel and happening at the same time. Well, it's possible, but usually the ALS goes with the, I'm sorry, the FTD goes with the ALS because what happens is, again, this frontotemporal lobe that I was telling you about before is the last to develop. But in ALS, with imaging or an autopsy, you can see that this area is shriveling. So people are not able to overcome that. The, 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 all these functions, emotional functions, planning, uh, organization, all that stuff, verbal, people are not capable of doing otherwise. And so, by the way, if you say to somebody, to your patient, uh, we're gonna do this, and he or she objects, they're not willfully objecting to you. They're not willfully being selfish or demanding. They can't help it. 
And, and that's, that's, I think, helpful in understanding where you're at and the difficulties that you're having. They're not doing it to hurt you. They're doing it because that part of their brain is deteriorating and they don't have choices the way we do. Um, it's possible, I guess, to have another form of dementia at the same time. Um, I'm not sure. Um, different dementias have different different outcomes. Um, for example, in, in um, uh, Alzheimer's, there's a much more serious memory loss than there is with FTD. Uh, FTD is more uh, reason, com common sense kind of things, judgment. Uh, people, people, for example, with with FTD will will embrace strangers, they, they, they're disinhibited, they don't have the same sensation, <clears throat> the same awareness that we, the rest of us have. Um, we have no assets under his name. Oh, can't get Medicaid or nursing, huh? We, I'm sorry, we took everything out, have no assets under his name and still can't get Medicaid or nursing. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that. Have you spoken to the social worker? Or do you have a case manager through the, your doctor or something like that? Um, yeah, we spoke to um, a case worker. Um, we spoke to several people. They gave us different advices and we still can't get anything. Huh. Like he has nothing under his name and he still can't get um, Medicaid. So when we even call Medicaid, um, yeah. they give us such a hard time. And it's like, it's like nobody's working there. It's like, uh -huh. it's unbelievable. I'm sorry. Talk to talk to Lorena, please, um, okay. because she. I know when I work with her, she has some really good suggestions and contacts that you might you might be able to go through, um, and, and so hopefully that'll work. But stay in touch with her too. Don't you know? Okay. I don't know. Did you talk with a lawyer? Um, no. Okay. Because no, I, the because what is I don't think a lawyer has anything to do with um, Medicaid, like getting assistance. Well, no, but maybe you know, I'm thinking as an if you go to an elder attorney, he may have contacts or recommendations. Well, he's not elder; he's only thirty-two. Oh, um, no, I don't I know don't, if you remember him. No, I don't mean that's his specialty, elder law. Oh, okay. Not that he's an old guy. But oh, that, okay. That's his specialties in it. And you can you can look that up in you know on Google or yellow page yellow pages. I'm giving away my age. Um, but, but check with Lorena because I know she has some good advice and she gives phone numbers that might be very helpful for you. Yeah, I think I, I spoke to her last year, but um she oh. directed me to a, a um she directed me somewhere and I know I called that number and um I just basically got like the runaround. Did, oh, well, you, you know what? I don't know how effective it is, but I once had a, it's another story. I once had a problem getting my IRS refund. Somebody stole my, my uh, social security number and the, and the IRS was giving me a really hard time. They ended up calling my representative, my local representative, and she stepped in and boy, did things start moving after that. So, I mean, it took a while to get my money, but nevertheless, but it, things were moving. You know, so maybe try your local representative. Okay. I would, uh, yeah, I would, I, I would go through every resource that I possibly could. It's very frustrating, I know. And it, and the other thing, I guess, talking about this is that there's this sense of helplessness that that go is endemic in dealing with a chronic illness, helplessness and hopelessness, and it's a real and it really exacerbates all the stress that you have been feeling or all the work that you have been doing all this time. Um, because, you know, the old expression, if wishes were kings, if we tried hard enough, if we wanted it enough, we could we could do this. But we're not going to, and that, that's a problem. We can't cure this, you know? It's, it's heartbreaking. We cannot cure this, but we have resources, God willing, um, with the team interventions i don't again the only the only intervention i know as far as medicaid is concerned is our social worker but um you just have you have to be persistent and I, i'm sorry to say that because i don't have any suggestions where that's concerned but 
uh, if your doctor has a case manager or the office, maybe they know something about doing this. Um, I don't know. You know, it's like trying to figure out as many possible ways. Let me see. Is it possible that the FTD shows up as the first symptom of ALS? Yes, absolutely. Sometimes that's, that's the earliest symptom. Uh, the question is, do people recognize it as, as a harbinger of ALS? Or it's just they just notice that there's something going on cognitively. Um, yes, and I, I, I've looked at some of the literature and I have not really seen anything. Um, I, th I, I think, you know, it, in a sense, it's like any other d dementia. People notice that there are changes, but they don't, you know, it doesn't go much beyond that. And you can always attribute it to other, well, he's overworked or she's busy or, you know, she hasn't been feeling well lately, something on that order. So I don't know how quickly I would respond. Well, I might respond quickly because I've been in healthcare for so long. But no, but how quickly do people say, uh oh, there's a cognitive change here. I'm going to go check it out. Usually not. Uh, but it, it's certainly a good question. And yes, it, it is a first symptom of ALS. And it could be um, useful if people were, I don't, again, maybe the, our doctors, our neurologists know how to, how to address that. Because if, uh, I'm going to say, because like with Alzheimer's, there's a much stronger memory component. With ALS, FTD, it's more um, behavioral you know, less, less, uh, more difficulty processing information, more difficulty speaking, more difficulty organizing thoughts, and that kind of thing. So it, it it's certainly something to discuss with your doctor. There's no question about that. Barbara, real quick, I'm just going to add to that question. Uh -huh. um, is it possible to diagnose ALS only with FTD? Or do you need to wait until another component like limb weakness or something also sort of adds to the mix like is it possible to say like oh you have ALS just by the FTD that like diagnosis like that type of FTD or not really it's not I, enough that's a really good question but I cannot answer that uh, okay. I think that's a neurology question or medical doc right. you know I think um could, well how many of you out there, how many of you, if you notice some cognitive changes, more apathy or uh, less initiation, people can't start things. They want, you know, they can't plan. Let's plan on taking, going to the grocery store and they cannot do that. Something really basic and they can't do that. They can't initiate something. Um, how likely would you be to say, oh, there's a definite change in this person. I'm going to follow up. Or would we attribute it to, well, you know, getting old, maybe he's getting Alzheimer's, whatever. I don't know. That's a really good question. And perhaps it's something that we should explore more in, in research and in, in outreach. How do, you do, how do you recognize this and what can we do about it? And I'm certainly going to ask the neurologist when I go in tomorrow. There's no question about that. If you're listening... Gina, we need an answer, <laughs> but it's a very good question. I don't know. I don't know that there's been a lot of research. Can you repeat the, the question again? And I will try. Oh, okay. The question is, if, if, if FTD can precede uh, physiological symptoms with ALS, how would it be diagnosed? Or, you know, would there be follow through so that I, I, I notice that my spouse is, is showing apathy or lack of initiation? Would I follow through with going to the doctor? And if so, what would they be able to find out? Yes. And uh, yeah, that would be if the patient was diagnosed with ALS, that would be a good idea to talk to the doctor, no, especially but, but, with changes of behavior or when uh, there, uh, some of the patients for for years, they were calmed down and they have a lot of changes in the way they respond to the the mm -hmm. wife or the or the husband or the way they behave with the rest of the the people. Those are changes that, of course, uh, I I think they are demonstrating like a changes 
And like you mentioned before, like 30 to 50% of the patients, they develop uh, FTD or frontal temporal dementia. And some patients start with the frontal temporal dementia, like you said, before they develop ALS symptoms like weakness in the legs or in the arms. Yeah. So that Gina, can happen. Gina, if, if, it, if we recognize that some people show FTD before there are sympt other symptoms, yeah, would would people be able to follow up on that? If I, you know, if I notice that my spouse is showing signs of dementia, if I went to my primary care physician, would he recognize it or say you need to do X Y Z or go to? Sometimes it's difficult for the physicians to recognize uh, right. that the patient is developing that. It have to be like. He's a smart to send the, the patient to see a psychologist that they can do a neuropsychology testing. Right. Right. But otherwise, they say, well, he's getting old. That's why he's had some changes in, in his behavior or he's getting upset or. Right. Yeah. yeah but, exactly. Thank you. Because people look for excuses why this is happening. Exactly. Exactly. They, don't, they, well, they don't, never go and look for assistance with the, they don't pay attention to those right. symptoms. Right. The first thought would not be to go see a neurologist. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the first symptoms of, FT, of FTD would be that, you know, apathy, difficulty with initiation, behavioral changes like hoarding or being more impulsive or um, uh, that kind of stuff, you know, like um, lack of emotion. Flat affect, that's what you'll see. You know, like a no expression on their faces. Blunt affect, that's exactly what it is. Um, difficulty thinking or processing information. Um, and so those, those are some of the early symptoms. Not focusing on goals issue, you know, things like that. Uh, even if it's a very simple goal, not necessarily um, going on a trip to Europe, but going to the grocery store. And they just don't have the motivation. They don't have the, the, the processing involved to, to plan something like that. So um, yeah, and, and some of it's very subtle. So you wouldn't really notice it. You wouldn't, you wouldn't attribute much to it. Um, dementia starts very gradually, any kind of dementia. And so you have to be really perceptive and then say, this requires a neuropsychological evaluation as opposed to, you know, somebody's changing. Uh, DCF will look back five years or so. Oh, Sh to Charlene, to everyone. DCF will look back five years. So if his name was removed recently from assess, that will still be considered. Oh, Ms. Barbara, that was, I was, I meant to send that privately to someone that was asking oh, about oh, I'm that. Sorry. I already communicated. Oh, okay. I apologize. No, okay. thank you. Never mind. But it is an issue. And I think it's unfortunate when you're dealing with the state for Medicaid or any resources like that. It's, it's, it's very frustrating. And it, it's helpful. It's helpful in any case to have an advocate if you can find one, whether it's a professional person or a family member, somebody to back you up and to be persistent with you so it's not such a hope, helpless, hopeless feeling. Um, I think when you're dealing with the state, it can be extraordinary. Well, you, I was gonna say dealing with the state, it's extraordinarily frustrating, but life is very frustrating these days. Did you ever pick up a phone to call somebody and they put you on hold? And they say, I mean, first of all, you talk to a robot. You don't even talk to a live person. You talk to a robot and the robot asks you questions and doesn't understand your answer. I'm sorry, I didn't, you know, would you repeat that or whatever? So it takes you five to 10 minutes to get past the machine to talk to a live person. And then you find out that there's a hold and it's you're gonna be on hold for 37 minutes or something like that. Uh, Technology is good only so far, and then it becomes extremely frustrating, you know. So that just adds to it. But if you if you are calling, and they say there's a thirty minute hold, keep leave the phone on, go about your business, keep doing what you're doing, and you know keep the phone nearby, and somebody eventually, maybe an hour, will say, you know, how can I help you or whatever, 
It's just a matter of being as patient as you possibly can, which is undoubtedly not an easy thing to do. It's also, by the way, um, I, don't, I don't push medications on people, but I don't think it's unusual or unnecessary if, if you're a caregiver and you're under distress, if you've been married a while, if one of you has a problem, you both have a problem. And sometimes we recommend antidepressants or anti-anxiety medication for our patients. But it's not a bad idea if you're really feeling overwhelmed that you consider taking an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety medication yourself. It, people people are, have been reluctant to do that uh, based on old information. Um, people are afraid that if they take something, it's going to change their personalities or they're not going to be able to think clearly or process well. That's not the case. The new medications that are out are very safe, so safe that they take anywhere from two to six weeks to build up in your bloodstream. So it's obviously not a radical thing. Uh, what it will do is it will give you a little better energy and it will make every day just a little easier to get through. There's nothing wrong in that, you know? Um, we like to provide whatever kind of assistance and aids we can for our patients. There's no reason why caregivers shouldn't feel equally entitled to doing whatever you can to make your lives easier. And, um, and then you don't have to take it for the rest of your life, but usually it's recommended that you take it for six months. It gets you through, evens you out. In the meantime, I wanna see what's there. We have three questions, Barbara. <laughs> and I, I just want to, I've just forgot my train of thought. In the meantime, oh yeah, in the meantime, when you're dealing with anxiety, depression, stress, self-talk is really important. I alluded, I said something about it before. This is the worst thing I've ever lived through. I can't stand it, whatever. Pay attention, then I'll get to the questions. Pay attention to the things you say to yourself. You know, we're all talking now, I'm talking. I move my lips, sound comes out, you hear me, you respond one way or another. That's having a conversation. But we talk to ourselves all day long and no sound comes out. It's called thinking. And your brain is never still. Even when you, when you sleep, you're dreaming. Your brain, your brain keeps your blood circulating, your food digesting, whatever. But it also means that you're thinking all the time. So what you say to yourself is really critical. And if you, as I said before, if you hear yourself making these negative statements, this is awful, I can't stand it, whatever, you, can, you have to change that because it's gonna make your life easier. Um, no, it's not, you know, it, it may be the most difficult thing I've ever had to do, but I'm learning, I'm competent. I know I'm helping my loved one, the care receiver. If you need help with that, let us know. We can help you with that. It doesn't happen overnight, but it's really worthwhile to, to pay attention to what you're saying to yourself because it changes how you feel and it changes your attitude towards coping. And if you really don't like the person you're taking care of, we need to address that too, okay? Okay, so um, oh, if there are initial signs, uh, Well, can FTD plateau? That, I, you know what, I, I, I can't, I'm not sure how to answer that because, oh, I have it here. We have this test that I administer to patients. It's called the ALS Cognitive Behavioral Screen. The maximum score is 20. Um, most people, well, most people early on, score between 14 and 20, depending on where they're at. But we have some patients who have scored two or four on this test. So yes, they, they, uh, if that's a, they can't get much worse if that's what you're saying. You know, they're not gonna get better, but this, I don't know, what can be worse than two out of 20? Zero, but they do progress that way and it, it's very, Challenging, certainly, for the people who are caring for them. Uh, does a typical brain MRI show FTD or only if they were looking for it? Well, good questions here. Um, you can see 
uh, again, this shriveling of the brain on imaging tests. I don't know. Um, you know, I don't know, doctor, <laughs> do, do neurologists or medical doctors or anybody look for those things? Well, they observe it. I'm sure they observe it if they're doing a, a brain imaging, they must see it there because unless they're looking at a different part of the brain, of course, um, they certainly see it on autopsy. Um, and again, it's the kind of thing like, you know, yes, I see it, I recognize it. What am I going to do about it? I can't make it better. So what do we do except learn how to cope and find options as best we can? You know, and, and as best we can means, I, I wanna emphasize taking care of yourselves as caregivers. Uh, you know you're gonna, your loved one is gonna be safe because you're doing all the things that have to be done, but you also need to take care of yourself. Um, did all ALS patients have pseudobulbar affect? Uh, and is this part of the FTD? Uh, no, the, not all patients have pseudobulbar affect. Um, and it's not, it's not part of FTD. Pseudobulbar affect starts out with, uh, it, it's part of the disease process. Some people start with it as a first symptom. Some people get to it later. Depends on the progress of the disease. Um, Anyway, it's, it, it, yeah, it's not necessarily connected to FTD that I'm aware of. You know, if you have other information, that would be okay to tell me. Um, yeah, this, this is so frustrating. I don't know. Um, if you, I, 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 I'm kind of stuck where to go from here because I want to know, I mean, are, are you, what is the most difficult thing you have to do every day or on a regular basis that compromises your sense of well being or your self efficacy? And that's one of the things I guess you can appreciate as caregivers that you are, you know, you're learning as you go and you, you are doing things that are extraordinary that you never in your wildest dreams ever imagined that you would have to be doing. Um, but here you are, you know, this is the reality of the situation. So what's your biggest problem, if you can tell me? And again, if you're dealing with somebody with FTD, don't expect reasonable conversation. So um, you're, you're, you're in charge and you have to, you know, figure out a way to cajole or cater to or uh, get along with somebody who's not really capable of, of decision making or you know or, or safety issues too you know you think you're having a regular conversation with a normal person and you're not so how do you deal with that and what's most difficult for you are there other cognitive impairments that may present for ALS patients well it's always possible to have comorbidities you know, it's always an option for that. I don't think we run into that really with our patients. Um, and then it would be difficult to tease them out, I suppose, if we were dealing with ALS, FTD, and then, I mean, it, it, there could be other issues that were pre-morbid, pre-ALS, but I don't know that they're, they're congruent with at the same time, this is developing. I'm gonna to have to go back to school to answer some of these questions. So are there particular processes or particular functions that you find more difficult and are looking for options or alternatives or support? I think we have it in the chat box, Barbara. Oh, thank you. Big issue is to learn what to expect each step of the way. Such a learning process. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And a lot of caregivers are unprepared for the changes that occur. Um, nobody can predict every, nobody can predict what the next step is going to be. Um, 
because everybody, you know, we say this all the time, every patient is different. No two people respond in the same way with this disease. So it's really, nobody um, can predict what's gonna happen next. Somebody wanna say something? No? One of the things I'd like to tell people about this is about expectations and you, you just brought it up. Um, we get into, you know, it, we were groomed, I think we grow up to have expectations. If I do this, then this is going to happen. If I do this for you, then you are going to respond in a certain way. Well, ex expectations can lead to many, many disappointments. Uh, I think I think in a disease like this, people will let you down. I thought I thought he would do X, Y, Z because I did A, B, C. Maybe, but not necessarily. The best way to live your life, and it's also extraordinarily difficult, is to have no expectations. And that's a life-changing concept. I know that. I'm going to do this because it's the right thing to do. I'm going to do this because it's helpful or I care about it or whatever your motivation is. But I have no expectations that anybody is going to respond to what I say or do. It's, it's very hard to change your way of thinking about that, but it makes life a lot easier. If somebody gratifies you, that's great. You're ahead of the game. But if you're doing something because you think this is going to happen or you think people will respond in a certain way, you're going to be disappointed. 